around 20 years ago, I was teaching a song. It was a song I commonly taught. The words lent themselves well to movement that the students enjoyed. In the tune, it was a catchy tune, the kind that stays with you long after you have sung and played. For most of my adult life, I have been a music teacher. I have sung songs, played games, and instructed children in how to make music, understand music, read and write music. For about 10 years, I taught at the elementary level, working mostly with kids in kindergarten through fifth grade. Like many of my colleagues, I believed in the importance of using folk songs in my classroom. I currently teach at the university level. I'm what's known as a music teacher educator, which basically means I teach students in college who want to become music teachers. My specialty is elementary general music. I share my background with you today because it's what has shaped me and defined me, and it's what has brought me to this stage. So back to that song. I was teaching the song to a group of third graders when something unexpected happened. Something dawned on me. I cannot definitively say why that day, why that moment, but what I can say is that it opened my eyes and it put me on a path that I have followed ever since. The song goes like this. For some, you might recognize the tune. The words might have just popped into your head. In case you don't know what the song is, the words describe picking cotton. Yep. Jump down, turn around, pick a bale of cotton. Jump down, turn around, pick a bale of day. Now you may be wondering in this day and age why anyone would think that that song was appropriate. Excellent question. Never in my experience had anyone questioned whether or not it was appropriate to sing a song about picking cotton. It was a way of life. It was an occupation. It appeared in countless folk song collections, especially collections geared towards elementary general music teaching, including one by someone who I would consider a member of the U.S. royal family of folk music, Ruth Crawford Seeger. And it was also a great song for teaching kids how to read and write music. It seemed to check all the boxes. No one had challenged it. But that day I did, in a small and frankly imperceptible way. I finally heard what my students were singing. I finally saw as they were jumping down, turning around, pretending to pick cotton. I saw that this song was glorifying something that had historically been done in this country by people who were forcibly brought here, by people who were slaves. I stopped the students. I told them we were moving on to a different activity and I never taught the song again. Fast forward to about five years ago, I had eliminated Pick a Bale from my collection, but I hadn't confronted the reality of some of my other songs. And this is when someone posted in a Facebook forum for music teachers about a different song, Jump Jim Joe. Now Jump Jim Joe is a very popular song in early elementary music classrooms, kindergarten through second grade. The words lend themselves well to movement. The tune is catchy and stays with you. And it is a great song for teaching kids how to read and write music. Sounds familiar. Hmm. However, Jump Jim Joe was originally Jump Jim Crow and was a song that came out of the minstrel period in the United States. This song was actually back to probably around 1830. The song was made popular and the character of Jim Crow was made popular by a man named Thomas Dartmouth Rice. Rice was a white man who was a carpenter, became an actor and a minstrel performer. Rice performed the character of Jim Crow in blackface. And he was quoted as saying that he designed the character in an effort to make people believe that blacks were better off in slavery and that they were inferior. So now imagine your kindergartner, a young black child comes home from school happily singing Jump Jim Joe. But you, as the parent, you know that the song was originally Jump Jim Crow. 
This is exactly what happened that caused that Facebook post that I mentioned. The parent was a university professor who had just taught a class covering Jim Crow. The parent reached out to the music teacher to express their concern and to teach the teacher about the song. The music teacher turned to Facebook to get advice from other music teachers. The responses were varied. Some people said, we need to eliminate this song. There's no place for this song in our curriculum. Other teachers said, its pedagogical value far outweighs any other issue. And besides, we're not teaching the history. And yet others said, we've changed the words. What's the big deal? No harm, no foul. Now granted, Jump Jim Joe is not as explicit as Pick a Bell of Cotton, but it is just, if not more, problematic. And herein lies the problem. We can't just change the words and rationalize the song's use based on pedagogical reasons and expect people to just forget the history. We just can't do that. When I was a music teacher, my primary goal was to teach my elementary students how to read and write music, to become notationally literate. The five lines on the staff, the spaces, the notes, the clefs, all of that. The songs I used were chosen because I believed that folk songs could help create community and could help my students learn to become notationally literate. Now, why does this matter with regard to songs with a racist past? It matters because it helps us better understand why this issue persists. When music teachers like myself teach music through a single lens, such as to read and write music, we often forget about things that make music so vital in our society. Yes, learning those skills is important, but the history and experience behind the songs and materials we use is also very important. There are many problematic songs out there, and it is our responsibility to take the time do the research and determine whether or not those songs are appropriate for our classrooms and for our communities. There is a difference between canceling and holding accountable. When we look at the songs that we assume are okay because we were previously taught them, we will sometimes find that they're not, and that holds us accountable. When we look beyond the notation, when we look at the history, the politics, the culture, the society from which these songs and so many others came, we actually open up music in a much more inclusive way. So is there a place in our curricula for songs with a racist past? Yes. But should we sing, play, and dance while we're teaching these songs? No. If we choose to use these songs, we choose to use them as a tool to teach about history and experience, not as an easy way to teach notational literacy. We need to find the songs that will help us create socially just pathways to the musical experience in our classrooms. Not songs that continue to perpetuate the violence and inequity of white supremacy and systemic racism. We cannot simply change the words and ignore the past, because when we do, we are doomed to repeat it. <laughs>